it's not one that is widely studied anywhere in the world. There are uh, no positions in Mandaistic as far as I know. Uh, it's not very frequently taught at universities. Every once in a while I, I hear tell of a university that offers a short course, but the main center for the study of, of Mande and the Mandeans, the Freie Universität in Berlin, doesn't have anyone teaching it right now. Uh, it hasn't since Heine Volk retired uh, several years ago. And so what I wanted to do to start off was to explain, perhaps, why one should study Mandaic. Uh, assuming, of course, that you're not in a sleepy Ukrainian town and looking for some after-dinner theater, uh, and have nothing better to do with your time, why would you study Mandaic, particularly if you're interested in subjects such as Semitic languages and the Bible, and uh, so, before we begin with an in-depth analysis of the grammar and study of the text and learning the language, I thought I would spend much of the first lesson trying to explain to you something about the Mandaic language and about the literature uh, in which it is found, and perhaps something about the community itself. Sure, let's see. So... All you need to do is put your name and your email here if you want to be added to the course website and then I'll put your name in there and you can see everything that I'm putting up that you can't see on the screen today but you will be able to in future days. So good if you only want to just in case. To begin, the Mandeans are a small ethno-religious community that is located at the head of the Gulf. The, this neologism that has entered the English language due to the geopolitical realities of the region. Uh, we don't, in Arabic, it's called the Arabian Gulf, in Persian, it's called the Persian Gulf, uh, in the petroleum industry, it's called the Gulf, so as not to offend any of these potential vendors. Uh, but that is primarily where the Mandeans were found up until about 2003. And this is an important fact because. This existence that they've led at the head of the Gulf, uh, in the marshy area uh, in the southern part of Iraq and also in the southwestern part of Iran in the province of Khuzestan, has left an indelible mark upon their culture and their language. Uh, and as a consequence, one cannot really study the Mandeans without coming to terms with the fact that A, they are a product of their environments, very much a product of the marshes of Iraq and southern Iran, and B, as a living tradition, they've acquired quite a lot of cultural and linguistic influence from this area. Now everything we know about the Mandeans, and I'll explain this when I get into the chronology, passes through the great filter of this lab. That is to say that none of the manuscripts that we have, that we preserve, that are found in all the great libraries of Europe, and to a lesser extent in other parts of the world, uh, predate the 16th century, with the exception of a small corpus of epigraphic texts that I will shortly discuss. <coughs> that means that by the time we receive these manuscripts, they've been copied and recopied and recopied and sometimes updated uh, to be relevant to the lives of people who are living in the Muslim world. And as a consequence, they've acquired not only Arabic vocabulary, but also references to the institutions and the facts of uh, the world under Islam. So, to give you an example, there are two manuscripts in Europe that are widely held to be the oldest Mandaic manuscripts, at least in any collection that we know of today. One of them is Huntingdon uh, 6, which is, I believe, found in the British Library today. And that is a copy of the Genzarabba, or Great Treasure. The Genzarabba is sometimes described 
As I said earlier, I don't very often have an opportunity to teach Mandaic. In fact, I've never had an opportunity before, and I myself was largely self-taught. I was not taught at the institution where I was in the degree. Uh, so to have so many students is a bit of a shock. Uh, normally, when I was a student, uh, my instructors, in order to scare us off, would give us more work than we could accommodate. So I once studied with a famous uh, Indologist, David Pingree, who had these wonderful sounding courses, magic in the Middle East and such, and we would think, wow, that's such a great course, I want to learn about magic in the Middle East, and then we would arrive on the first day, and there would be 50 people, and he'd say, I can't teach 50 people, so this course requires knowledge of Akkadian, Sumerian, Sanskrit, uh, you should be familiar with the literature on Florian, and so on and so forth, and little by little, everyone would disappear until there was just one Japanese grad student who could control all these languages. I won't do that to you today. Um, perhaps there will be some degree of attrition. But as I was talking about earlier, the Genza Rabba is sometimes described of, as the Bible of the Mandeans. And it's only called this because it's one of the most frequently copied books. And uh, it's the one most likely to be found in the homes of lay Mandeans. Those members of the faith who are not priests. Although it is copied by the priests, that was one of their major sources of income. And hunting time. Uh, hunting in six was copied in uh, 1615. It was acquired by uh, a collector, a merchant who had traveled to Basra in the southern part of Iraq at the head of the Gulf. And uh, for him, it was a new copy. Uh, but I believe at that point, I haven't studied the Colophon in detail. It had already been copied 30 or 40 times. So we know that this text was not composed in the 17th century, uh, unless the copies were degrading and they had to copy them repeatedly. It must have been copied much earlier, but we're not exactly sure how much earlier. There are, however, in a few of the chapters, References to Islam and Muhammad, right? This is a living tradition. People update their traditions to reflect their times. And so we know that it reached its current form sometime between the 7th century and the 17th century, because that's the earliest copy that we have. Another book that I worked on, which is called the Tarash uh, Adishyan, Conventions for transcribing it. The book Rashidihye, the book of John, was copied only two years after that. In fact, because we can read the colophon at the end of it, I know exactly when it was copied. It was copied on Thursday. I've made reference to these telephones. Uh, it's a very important thing when you're studying the literature in Mandaic. As I mentioned before, these manuscripts are likely to be found in private homes. They're very frequently copied. They're copied by the priests, um, and sometimes by people who are maybe not priests, but did it as a meritorious act. And as a consequence, Whenever someone copied a manuscript, they would give us the vital statistics at the end of the manuscript. They would say, I copied this on such and such a date, and I was living in such and such a place, and the ruler of the place at the time was so-and-so, and here's a little information about me. Uh, my name is X, I was initiated by Y, my father is Z. Um, I found this and I made this copy from seven other copies. I compared them all. I gave it to four other priests to look over to make sure that my work was done. They had a system of peer review. And they would trace the copies as far back as they could. Now in this case, this is our oldest copy of the Drashadikhi. 
there are exactly 30 generations of copies going back. And that's when they stop with the human world and they transcend to the light world. So, I copied this from so-and-so, copied it from so-and-so, yada, 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 until you get to the last in the chain of humans. And then it says, and he received it from people, Siwa, from the world of light. Now this is very, very uh, valuable information for us because it tells us information about manuscripts that you don't always have. Those of you who work with manuscripts know what I'm talking about. Uh, and it tells us something about the world in which these manuscripts were composed. Uh, one of the ones that I'm working on, uh, another copy of this same manuscript that was found in Flushing, Queens, uh, or rather it's in the possession of someone in Flushing, Queens, in the city of New York in the United States, uh, was copied in 1910 at the height of the Young Turk Revolution in the Ottoman Empire, and the copyist, uh, Sheikh Hamhatam, tells us a lot about this revolution, about the uh, new parliament that's been established in Istanbul, and how this has affected his people. Because this is a very common topic within the Kalfans. How are the Mandians suffering as a result of what's going on right now in the broader world? And he says, because the Turks have had this revolution, the empire, they have a parliament, and all of us have to be soldiers, even the sons of priests have to be soldiers, and they're forcing us to wear pants, and fezes, and jackets, and this is totally wrong for them, they don't like wearing western style clothing, but this is what the young Turks were doing at the time. So, you may ask yourself, I'm interested in the ancient Near East, I want to learn more about Biblical Hebrew or Targumic Aramaic or things that come from the period of late antiquity at the latest, and for some of you that may be even too late. So why do I care about all of these manuscripts collected by Europeans in the 17th century, which is not that long ago? For many of us, this is practically journalism, it's not history. Uh, and the reason I would say is because, as I said before, many of them were copies of copies of copies. But more importantly, the fact that there are copies and copies of copies, is this all done? Have all of you had a chance to sign this? Uh, as I mentioned before, I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation for you today. We aren't able to project it, but if you want to be added to a course website where I'll include some of this information, including paradigms and facts, then I will add you to it. Do any of you need this? I'll leave this right here just in case. Many of you, I've learned from conversations, are interested in things esoteric, and also in some of the mystical traditions of the Middle East, things that we know about only briefly from manuscript copies. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the Library of Qumran in the Judean Desert. Some of you may be familiar with the text from Nag Hammadi. Uh, these texts are very valuable because they're ancient. They're pulled out of the ground or out of a cave. And as a consequence, they resemble a snapshot of a time and a place and a language. And that's incredibly valuable information to have. But the communities that produce them are gone. And we can only guess at some of the valuable information that surrounds these communities. How did they read these texts? What did these texts mean to them? Uh, what were their own lives are? For groups such as the Essenes were entirely uh, reliant upon other people, other interpretations, secondary sources, but with the Mandaeans, we can ask them. We know exactly what they think about these texts, we can ask them exactly what they uh, interpret them as, and we are not doing so much guesswork that other people working in other traditions do. Uh, to give you an example, when I was doing my doctoral research, and I was working on this language, I sat down with my advisor, John Hunegaard, and we encountered a word in a text, and we were going back and forth for seemingly 10, 15 minutes, arguing about what it was, and then finally I just put my book down, and I said, I will ask my informant. And my advisor said, I forgot, you can do that. You can ask this person what this word means. I don't need, we don't need to guess about it. We actually have a source. Now, that's not to say that I'm fetishizing the native, that I believe that the community is always right, but I think as a baseline for our interpretation of these texts, we will go with what the living tradition has to say, and that's always been the approach that I've taken. So, first off, we're not entirely reliant upon medieval or post-medieval texts. Second of all, there are other facts that lead us to believe that this tradition is much older than the medieval period, and older than Islam. 
Early on in the history of this community, uh, there were several waves of interest, primarily among European scholars, in the study of these groups. Early on, people had made some wild conclusions about them and their relationship to the early history of Christianity. There are three scholars in particular that I'm thinking of. They were Bultmann, Reitenstein, and Bousset. And they had made crazy claims about, the, uh, about Gnosticism predating Christianity and in fact influencing it, and how Christianity was sort of a, uh, an interpretation of Gnosticism, a sort of watered-down version for the masses. All of you are familiar with what Gnosticism is. You all understand what I mean by this term, I want to explain. Yes? Okay, so... But short, the Mandans and the texts in which they are uh, uh, given to us are viewed as Gnostic texts. This has been the case in 1780, when a Norwegian scholar by the name of Matthias Nobel published an article, and this started the second wave of European interest in this topic, and he said, these are the Gnostics whom Epiphanius mentions in his Panaria. And so, from that moment, Western scholarship has viewed this group as the last surviving Gnostics in the Middle East, and this has been very useful in terms of branding it. And in fact, when I give presentations or my other colleagues who work on this topic, go to conferences and such, we always start off with a bit of disclaimer. I'm talking about Gnosticism, in fact, the only surviving Gnostic tradition from the Middle East, and this of course gets people's attention, because sometimes you need to do a little bit of showmanship in order to sell your product to the masses. Now, this is problematic, least of all because we're not exactly sure what Gnosticism entails, and very often when we reconstruct what it is, we go to things like the Mendian sources, so it's a bit tautological, we're running around in circles. But for our purposes, we'll say that these are Gnostics. In the early 20th century, it was believed that these groups had something to say about the origins of Christianity and the relationship between these faiths, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, the Abrahamic faiths. There was a backlash against this. A lot of Christian scholars in particular, people of faith, were unconvinced and they found that some of the cl strong claims made by scholars like Reitenstein and Bultmann contradicted their views of the origins of Christianity and so they set about trying to prove that this tradition was late. Spät und davor schlecht. Right? It's old, therefore it's got to be bad. And so they said this is an Islamic sect they're like the Yazidis or one of these other groups from the Middle East. They pre they postdate Islam and therefore they have nothing to tell us about the origins of Christianity. And that was a bit of a, a, a extreme reaction in the other way. And so there has been a kind of interrupted period in the study of Mandean uh, and the Mandeans and Mandaic. Um, I think the pendulum has began to swing the other way of late. Many scholars have begun to take uh, Mendeism and Mendeic language and Mendeic text very seriously, and you've seen a sort of renaissance of studies in this area. So, how do we begin? I mentioned earlier the colophons. Each of the texts ends with a colophon, sometimes the text of multiple colophons, uh, in which the priest describes the circumstances of its, of its copying. Uh, a scholar in the United States, my doctor Mutter, Jordan Buckley, has traced the colophons in one of these texts in the left-hand section of the Great Treasure, the Genzarapha, all the way to the 3rd century. She went back to a scholar who is known historically to be a contemporary of the Prophet Mani, the leader of Manichaeism, and then several generations before that, two or three, to a woman, Shlama Bar Kedra. And so, Based upon her research alone, it would seem that some of these texts, in some form or another, clearly not the form that we have them, but some form or another, have been cast on since the 3rd century. An independent verification of this comes from the work of another scholar named Torgi Save Sudurug, who published um, an edition, or rather a commentary, on the Coptic Psalms of Thomas a Manichaean text, so we're talking about the period several generations after when these first colophons were composed. This is the 4th century, and in these texts are extensive quotations also found in the Mandaic text, principally used to as well as a third known as the prayer book, the liturgy. So, I'm making no claims here as to whether they borrowed directly from Mandaic 
or both borrowed from a third source or one borrowed from the other. I don't know that. I don't think Sabe Sudebeck proved conclusively one way or the other that this was the case. But we do know that the text that they were copying in the time of Islam in the medieval period and these 17th century manuscripts that we have included material that is also found in 4th century manuscripts. And then finally, this is probably the last time I'll talk about this, starting just a century later in the 5th century, we have epigraphic remains, artifacts uncovered in archaeological excavations. And these take the form of lead amulets, of a genre that's still used today in the Middle East, today, I mean, that may be stretching it a bit, but within living memory, shall we say, uh, and incantation bowls. So the amulets are probably a little earlier. Uh, Mark Litzbarski claimed that they were earlier on the basis of paleographic evidence, and the paleography of Mandaic is not an exact science, so his claims are also somewhat problematic, but most scholars are content to say that the amulets on uh, um, grammatical and paleographic bases are older than the bulls, and they are scrolls, long ones about ye large, and if I were projecting I would show you a picture of one, on which someone is very carefully incised, probably with a sharp object such as a nail, a text. The first of which was published in 1904 by Mark Lee in a festry. And these texts contain, again, passages that we find in the Genzarabha and Drasidikye, but uh, in the Mandaic script. So we know that we're now dealing with Mantean texts. And these are the earliest ones that have been uncovered. The bowls are probably somewhat later, and I say that they're probably somewhat later because unlike the lead amulets, they don't contain they contain references to Islam and Arab names and such. Whereas to my knowledge, no lead amulet contains any such thing. Although the entire corpus has not been published. The bowls, on the other hand, are far more extensive in all the collections around the world. I'm talking about Baghdad and in London, and um, there are some even in the United States. Uh, these incantation bowls, which look very much like terracotta salad bowls, they're about yay large, and they have writing on them. Either they start from a circle in the middle and they spiral out, or they start in lines radiating out like spokes. And these uh, bowls were intended to do a, a number of things, uh, primarily to drive away evil spells and demons. And some of them clearly were also composed to trap ghosts and demons. They're kind of like, if any of you have seen the film Ghostbusters, I mean, when I started studying these things, I was a kid and I was entranced by this. They have a machine that would trap a ghost. So it would just light would come out and then the door would slam shut and the ghost would be trapped. And they would use these terracotta bowls in a similar fashion. They would take them and bury them either upside down or cut like this, underneath the threshold or underneath someone's bed at the four corners of a room, just to create a solid perimeter. What is called today in Mandaic a sorte, a kind of, um, uh, the term literally means seclusion, but uh, secluding yourselves from evil influences. And so, these bowls were therefore found in archaeological contexts. Next to, they were in Strata, particularly in the city of Nippur, which is excavated. Um, it wasn't James Montgomery who did it, but certainly the University of Pennsylvania had an excavation there in the early part of the, uh, the, the 20th century, which continued on and off for much of the 20th century, in context with coins and other artifacts so that we could tell. And the bowls that were uncovered in, in uh, in archaeological contexts were from, let's say, the 9th century, just immediately after, in the early years of Islam. Uh, my colleague Matthew Morgenstern, who's also here, uh, is preparing some incantation bulls, not merely Mandaic ones, but in other scripts as well, um, some of which have dates. The, the ones in the square script, in the Hebrew script, sometimes contain dates, and because we know the Jewish calendar, we can say exactly when these dates were. And the earliest one, I believe, if I'm not, make, uh, not entirely uh, wrong, is 534, the Common Era. So we're talking about the 6th century before Islam. So we can confidently say that these bulls were produced during a window of about a century before and after Islam, at which point people stopped doing them. I'm not sure why. The amulets continue to be made, 
It was a time not too long ago, in the living memory of many people in this room, when you could go to Baghdad or Basra, and you could ask a Mandaean priest to prepare for you an amulet, which they'd either do on strips of paper or on lead, and then they'd roll them up and you could do various things. You could wear them, or you could drink them, uh, you could drink uh, water through them, and this is supposed to have salubrious effects to protect you, uh, to give you good health, or to rid you of a demon that may be bothering you. So these are actual artifacts, and they come from the 6th to the... The Colophons and books go all the way back to the 3rd century. The 4th century, this is all in the Common Era. That's going to be the... Um, the uh, Thomas Psalms in Coptic. And then let's say fifth to ninth, we have bowls and amulets. Some people would say that this is when, this period immediately after the advent of Islam, is when the Mandaic texts assume the form that we have them in today. Uh, this is a well-supported assumption. It is a proposition. It, it's not a fact. I don't know this for a fact. But there are several factors that would lead us to believe that they are a product of the period immediately following Islam. The first piece of evidence is that they contain references to Muhammad and Islam within them. Very often at the ends of chapters, or in er other areas where you would expect interpolation. So, for example, the great treasure, which as I mentioned is kind of the Bible of Mandaism, is a miscellany of texts. None of these texts are written like a modern novel. They don't have a beginning, a middle, and an end. They're more of a salad of different texts. So we have prayers, we have histories, we have admonitions, very common, there's an entire genre of admonitions in which a light world being is saying, do not do this, do not canoodle with women. It's very often addressed to men for obvious reasons. Uh, do not drink wine, do not uh, wear brightly cut clothing. There are all kinds of things you cannot do. Uh, another genre is a kind of dialogue, usually between light world beings, in which one person asks another questions about the faith. And so these are the sorts of things that you encounter in these texts. A, a, a variety of things, not just one single theme. Um, at the end of the histories, almost always, when they're talking about the history of their communities, and the, uh, the great treasure begins with two chapters on the history of the world. At the end of the first of these two chapters, there is a reference to Islam. It's kind of added to the end. And by the way, in this year, then Muhammad showed up and that was the end. So that might be a space where you would easily interpolate data. You're updating a book. Number two, the reason why we might think this is the case is because of the religion Islam itself, right? We know that the ethnic and religious communities of the Middle East, when encountering Islam, and they had a new form of, of not just religious but secular rulers, were compelled to show evidence of the legitimacy of their religion. They're asked, how do we know that you are true faith and not paganism? And so many people at that time produced evidence that they have a divinely inspired message in the form of a book, and they had a prophet. The Mendians, in this case, said, we have this book, it's called the Genzer we also have the book of John, and John is our prophet. You know, this is a prophet that's known to the Christians, John the Baptist. He's also known to Islam, under the name of Yahya bin Zakaria. He's in the Quran. And so, this was the source of their legitimacy, and it was how they were allowed, for a period of over a millennia, more or less to practice their religion in peace. To the extent that one can do this in the Middle East, which is a tumultuous region of the world, they were very seldom, until the, basically until the 20th century, persecuted exclusively on the basis of their religion. They were persecuted for other reasons, I won't deny that, but it wasn't until very late in the history of Mandaism that Islamic scholars began to question the legitimacy of their religion. And then finally, in one text, I won't write it in that day. 
the Diwan Harun Guaytha. We have an account of one of the leaders of the community, Arishamma, by the name of Anush Anush Bardanka, who went to the Arab rulers with a copy of the book. And it says, at the time of Islam, he produced this book to, to, to uh, show that his religion is a legitimate one. And so we have within the Mandaean text themselves evidence that there was some sort of editorial activity going on as well. Yur and Buckley has found in the Colophons as well evidence of this. There are several scholars that she's identified who are involved in the producing of these books. And the books themselves, as I said, are eclectic. Uh, they show evidence of having been brought together of various pieces. One of the best examples of this is The Great Treasure, again, uh, which has no fewer than seven colophons within it. So a section will end, and then they will write a colophon. Not just one, as you typically find at the end of a manuscript, but multiple times. This suggests that it was united together out of different compositions. And it's a very large book, so that makes sense. So what scholars have suggested is that at this period, some point perhaps in the early 9th century, the end of the 8th, what people did is they brought together a bunch of their greatest hits and they put them together in the form of a codex, which is a new sort of uh, manuscript form for the Mendians. Typically they write these on scrolls. Diwan Haran Guaita is a scroll. A lot of their other things are scrolls as well. They formed a codex of their greatest hits and gave these to the Muslim rulers in particular the one known as the Book of John, in order to define themselves as a legitimate uh, religion. Ahl al a people of uh, the contract. So, that is one reason why we find some degree of Islamic influence in the text. It's because they were likely redacted at that period. After this period, we have a bit of a, a sort of dark ages, right? When we know very little about who is composing and what? We do know that at this point there were a lot of um, priestly commentaries that were composed during the Middle Ages. Uh, the community uh, today, as always, is very concerned about the rituals being performed correctly. So, uh, when, I was in, when I was a young man, I helped organize a Mendian conference in Cambridge. And I went through the trouble of getting a proclamation from Mayor Thomas Menino to, to change the name of the River Charles into the River Jordan for the day. And I was able to secure space along the Charles River for a baptism ritual, the first that had ever occurred in the New World. And many Mendians who were living in the U.S. at the time, many of them had fled persecution or come to the U.S. for economic reasons, came to be baptized for their children sometimes the first time in their life. And during that time, not at my baptism, but at one of the baptisms in America that followed it, the priest, uh, Sheikh Salah, who had performed the baptism, went to Detroit and tried it again, and it turned out that because of the unfamiliar environment, he was facing in the wrong direction. Well, that's it. If you're not facing in the right direction, if you're not facing north when you perform the baptism, you're in trouble. So he was not able to perform another ritual until he had been rebaptized 365 times by four gansivere, four priests, from big, big shot priests, not the low grade parish priest, but like a bishop type. So, for this reason, there's been an endless literature of priestly commentaries explaining just how you, you perform the ritual. And these are a later genre. There are other texts, such as the Book of the Zodiac and uh, the Diwan al-Wathur, and other texts that are clearly from the medieval period, we can guess because of the language within them, and they're among the most frequently copied texts in the literature, but they are only found in priestly families, and they're not as frequently discussed by scholars for two reasons. Number one, they do not have the cachet of the canonical holy texts like the ones I've written on the board. And number two, they're extremely difficult to read, belonging to a later stage of language with which many scholars who study ancient Near Eastern languages are unfamiliar. Right? You need to know a lot about Arabic to read these things. What's more is you should know something about the dialects of Arabic spoken by the Ma'adan and these people in uh, Amara and in Suqashiyukh and these areas, Maisan and Nasiriyah, in the southern part of Iraq. And not everyone knows these dialects. And they have some peculiarities that manifest in the text. So one such a, example is the Qaf, right, a very characteristic sound in Arabic and in any Semitic language. 
has become affricated to a jet. So, uh, uh, in the province of Maisan, on the border with Iraq, uh, Iran, there is a town named Suq al -Shiyuk. No, no, I'm, uh, that has a cough in it, but I'm thinking of Khalid Saleh. Khalid Saleh is in Maisan, it begins with a cough, as you can hear, but the people who live there are called Jilid Saleh. Right, so if you didn't know that Qaf is a jim and you encounter an Arabic word and it has a jim in an area where you're not expecting it, you don't know what that word is and so it's very difficult for you to read that. So you need to control Aramaic, you need to control standard Arabic, you need to control Arabic dialectology in order to read these texts. And no one has the time to do that. So there is one scholar, a Romanian scholar, by the name of Bogdan Bortea, who was graduated from the uh, Freie Universität in Berlin, and he is still there, I believe, and he has become the master of translating these texts. So he's primarily working on these texts from the medieval period. He's preparing an edition of the one Haram Boetha as well at this point. So one of the things you may be getting uh, from what I've been telling you so far is that there are a lot of texts in this language. There's an entire library of texts, not all of which have been thoroughly elaborated by scholars. Even if you ignore the bowls and the amulets, of which there are hundreds, even if you ignore the priestly texts, these texts as well have not been thoroughly documented. They don't exist in translation in most languages. Uh, many of them are only available for study in the German tongue. Uh, I'm currently working on the translation of Drasche Rekie in English. Uh, it's a new one. I'm hoping to improve upon the earlier German one, which is from exactly 100 years ago. Uh, so. What I'm trying to say is that there is much work for those of you who are interested in doing Mandaic, maybe not work funded by university chairs, but nonetheless you will find yourself engaged for the rest of your scholarly life if you choose to pursue the study of Mandaic literature. We don't hear much about the Mandaeans until the arrival of missionaries in the region of Iraq and Iran. As you know, there was a scramble for these regions, in particular, uh, the Portuguese were invested in colonizing India, right? They had rounded the Horn of Africa before the other European powers. They had created Estado do India, which was one of the richest parts of their empire. And they were very much invested in protecting the route to this empire. Now imagine if you were the Portuguese emperor, Dom Pedro, and you wanted to be able to control the supply route, the overseas supply route to India, and you discover that living in the heart of the Ottoman Empire, in the Persian Gulf, was a group of people who claimed to be the persecuted descendants of John the Baptist, well then you would naturally decide that you need to help those people to liberate them from their Muslim rulers, and that was what they sent uh, mostly Carmelite monks there to kind of teach them proper Christianity. And so these Carmelite monks, uh, mostly, most of whom were Italians, came to the Persian Gulf to document their language and they purchased the oldest versions of the manuscripts that we find in France and Germany and the UK. Uh, some of the ones which I've been mentioning here as well. The oldest copy, the one that was composed on 19th of October uh, 1617, is now in the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in France, um, and it was acquired by some of these missionaries. And they were also the first to document for us the Mandean religion. So we had a first wave of European scholarship on the Mandeans already in the middle of the 16th century and continuing until around the end of the 17th century, until 1683. That is when the Portuguese mission in Basra was pulled, right? Shah Abbas and all of these Iranian rulers were threatening southern Iraq. The Portuguese had lost India to the British and the Dutch, and they no longer had any reason to maintain stations in the Gulf, so they pulled out. That was the end of the Persian, uh, sorry, the Portuguese Empire in this region. And once again, we enter a period where Europeans are not very interested in Mandeans, perhaps because they're not engaged in them. As you know, the study of the languages and literatures that we do is very much sort of uh, an adjunct empire. Many of the greatest scholars who engaged in these studies did so because there were uh, geopolitical reasons to do so. And so, uh, when there were no longer missionaries and no longer Westerners in Basra, there stopped being 
the acquisition of Mandaean texts and description of the Mandaeans. And we have to jump again to the next wave of studying the Mandaeans. So this is Seventeen eighty. There were a group of scholars even known as Orientalists who continued to discuss, maybe not the Mendeans, but they discussed this group known as the Sabians of the Quran, because Europe still remained very interested in Islam. Europe had at that point the Ottoman Empire, which was the largest, richest, most powerful state in Europe up until, well, you know, shortly after this. And as a consequence, Islam was still very much a, uh, a, a compelling concern for Europeans. And so there is a group of people, as many of you must know, within the Quran, known as the Sabians or Sabians. And the identity of this group is somewhat enigmatic. No one is exactly sure who they are. They've been variously identified with different groups. But Orientals would write about them and attempt to find out who they were. In 1780, a scholar by the name of uh, Matthias Norbert, whom I mentioned before, a Norwegian, published an article in which he talked about this community, working from some of the manuscripts in France at the time, and it was in that article that he not only started to develop his own scholarship on this group, but also introduced the, the, the brand of the only surviving Gnostics from late antiquity. Almost 40 years later, 35 years later, he published the very first translation of any of these texts into a European language. This one. Not content to translate it, he translated it into Latin. He didn't translate it into Norwegian because at that point no one would read it. He translated it into Latin, which was at the time in the Western, uh, in Western Europe, the language of scholarship. Uh, and he improved upon it. So he thought, this language is a kind of bad Syriac, so I'm going to make it proper Syriac. And this Norwegian set about writing it in Syriac letters and modifying the grammar so as to make it more Syriac. And of course, if you read the Latin translation, it reads very much like the Bible. I mean, this was also his model for when he was trying the Vulgate edition of the Bible. So there's a lot of contamination coming from all areas. But when he published this book, he called it... Codex Nazareus. The reason for this is simple. One of the oldest terms the Mandaeans use for themselves is Nazarenes or Nazarites. It's a term that may be familiar with you from the vocabulary of the Bible and both the Old and the New Testament. John the Baptist himself was said to be a Nazarite. And there was some discussion among the people, the authorities I mentioned earlier, Boltzmann and Heisenstein, over the etymology of the word Nazarene, as in Jesus of Nazareth. You can't quite get to Nazareth from Nazarene. Uh, so he gave it a title that he thought would resonate with the primarily Christian Western European scholar, scholarly audience at his time. And it did. It went like gangbusters. Um, some people have accused the study of Mandaism to be a bit wonky, a bit hokey. There's a lot of new age going on. And it all starts from here. One of the readers, I think a decade or two later, of this Codex Nazareus, I'm not sure if she read it in the original Latin or through some German translation, was Lady Helena Blavatsky. And in her first two books, on what she came to call the Theosophical Religion. She writes about Codex Nazareus as being the earliest instantiation of true Christianity, right? The version of Christianity which most allies itself with the religion that she was creating at that time, but she claimed to have a much older pedigree. 
And she mixed together aspects of Mandaism and Zoroastrianism and Hinduism and Buddhism and lots of other things. She was uh, very kind of profligate in her approach to religion. Um, so she, uh, but in her earliest work, she can see the influence from the Mandaean text, at least this one that had been improperly translated into Latin. And all European scholarship after 1815 is indebted to Norberg's translation of this text. Right? This is what started the second wave of European scholarship on this topic. And incidentally, through Blavatsky, the New Age movement has its roots in this translation. It wasn't until much later that a scholar from Germany, from what was then actually, I should say, Prussia, a gentleman by the name of Heinrich Tetermann, got a sabbatical. This is during the Crimean War. And Petermann had to do something with his sabbatical time, and uh, like a lot of crazy Orientalists, he decided, I'm going to go to the Ottoman Empire, I know the Crimean War is happening and all that, but I, I think it would be nice to take some time in the Middle East. And so he traveled, first to Istanbul and from there to Lebanon, and eventually he made his way all the way to Iran, and he published uh, in 1865, a book called Reisen im Orient, right? His trips to the Orient. And it reads like nothing you've ever read before, Orientalist literature, you know. He has all of these tropes that we associated with the genre. He talks about how upon arriving in Beirut, he engages the service of a Maronite manservant because as a, as a European gentleman in, in the Orient, one must always have a manservant. Uh, if not because you need anything, if simply to carry your pipe, you need to have a manservant. And so he brings him along, and he tells all these amazing stories about the encounters he has with various religious minorities in the region. He visits the Druze on Mount Lebanon. He visits the Yazidis. He visits the Mandaeans. He visits all these groups. And he's the first person since the days of the missionaries to do real field work. But his field work has a certain... I hesitate to say objectivity, detachment, but he, he writes about them in ways that are not quite as loaded as the missionaries, who are hell-bent upon either discovering in Mandaism an inferior form of their own religion, a kind of lost Catholicism, or to prove that these people are liars. Petroman doesn't care about these things. More importantly for us, he starts bringing back the first manuscripts since the days of the missionaries. And he publishes one in, uh, this is Kedama. And so, so you don't have to write all this down because it's going to be on the website. Two years later, in 1867, he publishes the Tesoros Magnus. The same edition here, but not a translation, he just publishes the text. He published it on the basis of four exemplars, right, including the best manuscripts that he's found in the libraries of Europe, and they made multiple copies of it. Which is wonderful because now, for the first time, scholars have access to an actual Mandaic text, right? Before they only had Norberg's improved version of the Mandaic text, Latin and then Syriac facing pages. Now they can just read Pectomon's edition, which is a very good edition. It's horrible handwriting, but it's very good. And it became the basis for all subsequent scholarship on this community since then. And this is really, 1867 is when you start to see an explosion of scholarship on the Mandaeans. Right? Rigid philological text-based scholarship. I don't want to omit the Russian scholarship. There is a scholar by the name of Colson, who may be known to you. Yes, Colson, yes. Daniel Avramovich. And he wrote this book called, uh, it was published in German, but. Um, Sabians. Yes, the Sabeo und Sabeismus. And so, uh, this is a very important book in the study of the Mandians because, as I said before, uh, attempts have been made to connect them to the enigmatic Sabeans of the Quran in Oriental scholarship for at least four centuries. Now, he addresses the whole topic of what Sabeans are. And it's a fascinating topic. I encourage all of you to go out and read about this. Um, 
it, it's kind of like a Helen says. People, much like the Mendians, when people look at Sabians, they project whatever they want to see on them. Because if you actually read the Quran and what it has to say about Sabians, it doesn't tell you anything. And if you go to the earliest sources, right, the earliest Islamic exegetes and scholars, the people writing commentaries in the Quran, they don't know either. They, some people say, oh, they're Greeks. Some people say that they're, oh, they're Persians. One person says they're Chinese. Uh, no one knows. So the Sabians became a kind of default category against which anyone, Muslims, Christians, whomever, could project what they needed to see. And as a consequence, various groups in the Middle East claim to be Sabian in order to enjoy the protection of Islamic law and freedom from persecution. They kind of muddied the water in this regard. So as a consequence, there were groups, fake Sabians out there. I don't really think this is an a appropriate term because I don't believe there was actually ever a community called Sabians. I think it's a term like Oriental. I think it's a blanket analogy that Muslims, who are now rulers of a vast multi-religious empire, needed to come to terms with religious pluralism in their empire, and said, okay, we have Christians, we have Jews, and we have this other group right here, crazy people, I don't know what they're doing. They're the Sabians, right? And that could be anything. So I don't think that there are fake or real ones, but Paulson writes about this very topic, and what he has to say, I think, is inspired. It predates by like 150 years or more the words of Edward Said, the scholar of Orientalism, who wrote the book by that title, in which he basically says what I just told you, that there is a group, and all these different people use this group as a discursive concept for their own purposes, and that the scholars who discuss this group have basically elaborated it, they've created it out of nothing. Right? It's a vague term like Oriental, and then suddenly it has a meaning. And not only that, but people say, oh, I know what Oriental is, it's this, you know, it's Aladdin and Alibaba and flying carpets and all that. The same thing with the Sabians. They began to acquire characteristics that were imposed upon them by scholars. And when people encountered the real Sabians, the Mandians, he claims that they're the Mandians, they didn't quite match up to the image that scholars, Islamic and European, had of them. And so there was friction. Right? This is the cause of what has happened recently with the Mendians, ultimately. Oh, what I should have led was, was, they lived in these regions at the head of the Gulf until 2003, when the invasion of Iraq happened. And since then, in almost every country they have found, they've been subject to ethnic cleansing. And now very few of them live in their homeland. Most of them, well, they live all over the place. The largest community is in Sweden. There are many in Australia as well. There are some in the U.S. and Canada. But if you go to Iraq now, you will find maybe five families. Right? Some in Syria, well, not Syria anymore, but many of them ended up in Syria. Some of them ended up in Jordan. They're gone too. They just can't live in the Middle East anymore. So, one of the reasons for this is because scholars, both Muslim and Christian, attempted to impose upon them an identity, and they were found lacking in every case. So, to make a long story short, from this point on, the end of the 19th century, we started to see multiple texts, Mandaic texts, being perused. Julius Oiting published a copy of Dewan al and then Mark Lee Sparsky, Henri Pognon, a French scholar, started publishing the bowls I mentioned at the end of the 19th century, he published a corpus of them in 1898. And then finally, we have the career of Mark Lee Sparsky, who is probably known to all of you. Are you familiar with Lee Sparsky? Sure. So he, this is an amazing story. The gentleman was from a Hasidic community in Poland, and then he converted to, I believe, evangelical Christianity to become a professor in Berlin. And uh, he was one of the greatest linguists of his time, or of any time. I, I read practically everything he wrote, and every time I read it, I discover something new. It is to his agency that we have proper scientific textual editions and translations of all of these things that I've written on the board. In the 1915, starting from 1915 to the 1920s, he produced multiple editions and translations of these things for a European audience. And then people who were engaged in these issues, who are the Sabians of the Quran, what is the relationship between Christianity and Gnosticism, could now read source texts that they could not before. Right? They didn't have the linguistic abilities, they didn't have the resources. And as I mentioned, there was an explosion. Uh, some people made claims that went too far, Boltmann and Bousset and Reichenstein altogether. 
And then people withdrew. They said, this is all late. I'm not interested in it. Well, it opened the door for us because we now have an opportunity to reappraise the subject, look at it with fresh eyes, and try and see the Mendians for who they are. So, this is the first lesson, and uh, I'm going to erase all of this. How are we doing time? At least half an hour. I don't know that half an hour is enough time, but uh, for those of you who couldn't make it before, usually when you start to begin the language, you start with the first principles, and in this case, the first principles are the Mendaic alphabet. Right. Um, it's going to be a bit okay those of you who studied uh, language before, you know, we saw the alphabet. Uh, I don't know, I was in these days, they're all much younger than I am, I think, but uh, when I studied Oriental languages, the professor would usually hand you a grammar and say, okay, on Tuesday I want you to know the alphabet, and that was it. Uh, nowadays, I teach Arabic in, in New Jersey, and when I first started teaching it, I was told, we spent the first semester learning the Arabic alphabet, and this is because this is what the U.S. Army does. And I, I think that's too glad to end. I think, I think people can learn a script, even a difficult one like the Arabic script, um, in fewer days in the whole semester. So let me begin. I would present a uh, lovely typeface which I'll share with all of you as well. I designed it myself. It's big among these, these Barsky's own handwriting. I, I, because I find it much better than anything that's out there. Some of you may know that uh, Mandaic is now part of the Unicode, the sixth uh, generation of encoding, and therefore what it is is a Unicode font. Uh, let's start off with this. <coughs> And I'll give you the names as well. So, important to start with this little circle, and this is indeed called Halka, which is circle in Mente. And some, some people say it's like an olive. And they all just transcribe it as an A. Usually, people will ask me. Uh, some of them do. Some of them translate it with a uh, Hebrew alphabet. Some of them make it a glottal stop, which is totally out of the question. But here it is on the top. That's the mandate right there. Sometimes this is called the well because it's the first letter in the word Eni, right? Eyes. So the the well spring. <clears throat> it's also described as the crown, which all the letters wear on their head. Now there are 24 letters in the Mendeic alphabet, the first of which and the 24th of which is A. Right, so we all begin and we come back in a circle to the first letter at the end. There's one for every hour in the day. It has a sort of astrological significance. Um, there's a lot of esoteric uh, lore behind the Mendeic alphabet. One of the texts I described before, uh, I mentioned it but I didn't write it on the board, it's called Asfan Mawashi, I'll write it down for you later, the Book of the Zodiac. It begins at the very beginning with the story of the alphabet. It says, once there was a kingdom, it was actually more of a republic, with 24 kings in it. And these kings were the letters of the alphabet. And they grew proud and they separated from one another because they wanted to be independent. And suddenly, language lost all meaning. We couldn't do, we didn't know left from right because of course we couldn't spell either. And all of our ritual utterances were confused. And again, this concern with praxis, with uh, ritual performance. And as a consequence, the 24 kings put aside their egos and they joined hand once again, they formed the circle, and they formed an indivisible republic of letters. And that was how we have structured language. So, I won't write any words at the end of the day because there are none, but it's found in practically all of the words you'll be seeing a lot of it. The next letter that I want to do is bad. This is bad. Already we can write at least one word. We can write. Now, this is a ligature to script. That means the letters join together. Most letters will join to the right. Very few will join to the left. I mean, some of them will not, very few will not join to the left. Bad means he wants it. 
It's also the um, a word for dove. Or at least in a certain ritual context, it's the dove that is sacrificed during the Lofani. When Mendians eat meals for the dead, they have something called a bow, which they sacrifice. Um, we can also, by adding an A at the very beginning, which is one of those letters he said that does not join to the left, just like that, we get the word for father, Abba. Right, this will be familiar with you, to you from all these other Semitic languages. As you might expect, another letter that joins in both directions is Gad. And this looks like this. Actually, I won't even bother with the Hebrew and the Arabic. I'll just put next to it the way I'm going to be transcribing it so that you know. So what are some words that have gap? Uh, at this point, we have very little, but we do have three letters which we could use to write a letter a word. Um, so this is gaba. Gaba, which means he selected or he chose. So you can see the, the yeah, and I've already heard another word like it's not a proper mandate word, but oh well, you see in some of the color fonts, it means sir. Those of you who know Farsi will well, it won't connect to the, the but let's say we had a word like bugger, it would be the bad. So we do this. It connects to the right and left on both sides. If I'm going too fast, you can't read what I'm writing. Please stop me. The next letter is the da. Every single letter within this alphabet has a name. Some of them are more complex, like this one, which is called halka, which just means circle. Most of them are just the letter plus a. So this is a d. Now pay attention because, as in practically every other language that you will learn here at the summer school, it's very often confused where they are. I'm not sure why this is the case with Semitic languages. They just like to confuse D's and R's. Uh, the R, as you'll see later, is a bit more elongated, but now I can write all kinds of words, right? Uh, let's write one of the most favorite ones of the Semitic languages. This is... Can you want me this? Yes, what do you think it means? Labor. Well, it's, it's, it's from that root, right? But what means he did. Or he made. He worked, you could also say as well. So, a what? I kind of smoothed it up there. Let's write it out a little better. Something like that. Not a bar, which also means something. Then the head would be a little longer. Yes, a what? A, a what? A bad, if you want to pronounce it. I will uh, transcribe it right here. Now, yes, there is a problem here, right? Mostly when we write these things, when you see the uh, text, uh, proper text edition, they will just simply write the primary meaning of each letter. A, D, A, D. Now, no one actually pronounces it this way. This is the difference between transliteration, one character for each letter, and transcription, which is writing how I wish that people pronounce it. Now, I am pronouncing them from a certain tradition. It's actually the Iranian tradition. There is an Iraqi tradition as well, which I'm familiar with and I'm comfortable with, but they don't like one another. It's a big surprise in the Middle East. The Iraqis and the Iranians don't get along well. In terms of Mandaic dialectology, they don't get along either. Uh, as we learn, another word that I could have put here on the board, uh, let's see here. Yes, now this word means gate, it can also mean chapter. And in Iranian, it, mean, it is pronounced wow. And the Iraqis find this so hilarious that it's one of the things that they'll ask the Iranian Indians to pronounce that's an uh, open A. I could have just as easily have written it with an A with a macron on the top. But because it actually is the sound pronounced in the back of your throat, I write it that way. 
So that's one of the differences in the pronunciation. You don't have to worry about this too much. Uh, tomorrow's lesson is going to be about the phonology of Bande, and I'll talk about the orthography, but for today I just wanted to get through the 24 letters of the script. Um, I could also write this. This is another one that you'll need. Gather, yes, luck. So that's gather is luck. Yeah. Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's just like the word in Hebrew. Okay. Here's another very important letter. This is ha. Can I raise some of these? Okay. Mm -hmm. Those of you who have studied Syriac will say you're spelling that wrong, you're pronouncing the wrong, Professor Hebel. It's supposed to be ha. No, no, no. They don't have such. I mean, they do have such sounds, but what has happened in Mende across the board, much has happened in Akkadian, is a weakening of these guttural sounds which were later reintroduced through spiralization. But this letter, although it is graphically similar to the Syriac ha, it's actually pronounced ha. And so if I want to write, what's that going to be? Ha. 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 And that is the number one. Interesting. And the, this is the feminine form, which is you masculine nouns. If I wanted to write the masculine form, it's just going to be simply this. Head. Uh, moving letter wrong. This is the U sound. Most famous from the conjunction, and you'll see this a lot. It's very simple, it's just a line that goes down, almost vertical stroke, continuing to the uh, left. And it also connects to the right. But you'll most frequently see it at the beginning of words. And so I could write, ooh, I could write uh, in the preceding letter. This is who. Who is he? Just like so. All right. Then you on the next board, a straight vertical line, all on its own. Right. This does not connect to the left ever. It just goes straight down. If it connects to the right, which it can, it goes like that. This is the Z. Uh, and I could use. This is a useful word to know. Zola means wife. Or if I want to transliterate it, <laughs> Zola. Yeah. It's from Greek originally, I think. So it must. Ah, uh, Gimne. What's that? Gimne. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, who was who? The next one, which I don't want to spend too much time on, I said there were 24 characters, they're not actually letters, some of them are actually morphemes. We're encountering the first one here, which is this. And that is traditionally transcribed as an H for the line under it. This only appears at the end of a letter, uh, end of a word, where attention, it very often looks like exactly like an egg. So if I were to write for you inside, if I want to do it properly, I'll make that a little longer like that, but not all copyists are so careful. That's inside him. His heart is inside him, right? If I were to do it inside her, it would be like this. So Bagobo. Either H or A at the end, right? For he or she. 
but it's not always clear. It very often ends up just looking like this. So very often in the manuscripts that you read, there is no distinction between this letter and the very first letter of the alphabet, which is also the 24th letter. Yes? Can I ask you a question? It's actually the third masculine singular pronoun. In Syriac, this would be E, right? Uh, but in this case, it's pronounced E. Except in Iraq, it's still pronounced E. So, if I wanted to say inside him, I would say Begomi. Right? But I'm not going to get too detailed into the phonology today. Um, Probably resembles Tamar Buta graphically. It does a little, doesn't it? Yeah, but it, that will leave you aside. Yeah, it does look like Tamar Buta, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it gets even worse, I hate to tell you. <laughs> Just wait until I get to the sibilance. So, this is the call. I mean, it's the thought there. Uh, Dawa. Yes, Allah, right? T A B A. I would pronounce it Fobo. This means good or a blessing. If we add the next letter, which is this one, this is the mirror image of this one, right? And very often in manuscripts, they're confused, not just by scholars such as you. When you're reading, you're going to make this mistake all the time. I do it myself, between I and you. Maybe it's because I'm dyslexic, I don't know. But I'm convinced the copyists also made this mistake. So, if I were to write this, we'll get to this character later. This is the Mandian holy of holies, you know, it's a liturgical expression used during the ritual. So, uh, good is good for the good. Something like, a blessing is best for the good people. Right? They say this, it's sort of a... Um, You can see right there, it connects the right letter, but never to the left. That's how you distinguish it from the U all the time. Whereas the U connects in both directions. This one right here. This is an I. Um, another one I could probably do is another very important mandate word, which we'll use today. I may end up having to. Just to illustrate the difference between these two characters, this is, you can read it already at this point, Ziwa or Ziwa means light or radiance. And this is a very common epithet of divine beings in the Mandian religion, mm -hmm. both Hebrew Ziwa and so on and so forth. It's a very important word for um, Mandian religious literature. I may have to stop here since we're running out of time. Those of you who already know the Semitic languages before will know what this is already. It's a K. Um, <coughs> if I were to simply write this, A K A, not also known as, but Echo. And this is, there is or there are, it's an existential particle. So if I wanted to say, um, the mandate equivalent of the Shahada, if you want to say, the only God is God, they say, Echo He, Echo Mor, Echo Mendote. God exists, God exists, God exists, right? Actually what they say is, life exists, my Lord exists, knowledge of life exists, but uh, according to believing Mandians today, all these things are basically versions of the same one thing. It's a kind of Trinitarian statement. right? It gets people in trouble if they say, aha, you just mentioned three names, so therefore either you're a Christian or you're a pagan. Uh, but in actual fact, that's not how they see it at all. Okay. So at this point, we still have about another 12 letters. I mean, I could stop or we can continue tomorrow. I don't want to keep you longer. It's been a very long day for all of you, first day of class. What do you think?
All right, I'm going to be talking more about the script and the language, the pronunciation of these things tomorrow, so this will give me an opportunity to have something to say, uh, and we'll continue with the rest of the alphabet and the pronunciation of the language tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>